Hello, my name is Tim Carbring, Director of Civic Education at the Indiana Bar Foundation, and welcome to our video learning session for the 2024 National Civic Learning Week. We're going to take a dive into learning about the judicial branch of government today, and we have two outstanding jurists to guide us through it. So we're excited to welcome Judge Robert Altice, Chief Judge of the Indiana Court of Appeals, and Judge Maria Granger, Judge of the Floyd County Superior Court Three. Thank you both. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We're happy to be here. Yeah, Thanks. awesome. Awesome. Um, so how, can we just start with the, the kind of the introductory question? What do you do as a judge? You know, now you've got this role. We hear about them all the time. What's a judge? What do you do? Uh, judge Altice, do you want to start? Sure. So um, I review everything that Judge Granger uh, does in her courtroom. So uh, I like to uh, refer to my job being on the Indiana Court of Appeals as uh, kind of an instant replay booth that you see uh, in football games. Uh, so we get a case from the trial court and uh, we look for errors uh, that the parties raise. And if we find errors, in other words, if we find that the receiver wasn't in bounds, then we reverse the trial court and send that back down and tell them to do it over again. However, the majority of the time, uh, the instant replay booth uh, comes back with the judge got it right this time, just like the officials oftentimes get it right. So that's how I, uh, the type of work that I do, um, but all of our, uh, my work is written work. Um, whereas Judge Granger, as she will explain to you, uh, is more the day-to-day -day operations in the courtroom. Uh, I do not do that. I review transcripts and then write opinions on the issues that are relevant to that case. A great explanation there, too. So, Judge Granger, you're the judge that we typically see on TV. You know, so you know, what, what's your judge day like? Yeah, so at the trial court level, we hear cases of what is called original jurisdiction. So we are the first court that the parties will encounter. Um, so we are working inside the courtroom every day. Um, we are seeing litigants in person inside our courtroom. So they're bringing um, their disputes um, right before us. Um, we're also um, overseeing um, all of those supportive departments um, that run the engine of justice. So our probation departments, our problem solving courts, um, we are working with the clerks and making sure the paperwork is getting filed and put to record properly. Um, we are also um, coordinating with um, public defenders to make sure that they are um, have the, the supportive services um, where, they, where we can uh, assist them. Um, we're overseeing our self-help centers um, and just a myriad of administrative duties, as well as deciding the controversies that come before us. Ultimately, if a party, just like Judge Altai said, if, if they get my decision and they want a further review of that, um, they won't go to another trial court. They're going to take it to the appellate court. Uh, so much that both of you do in your separate courts that build on each other, I think, within the judicial branch. So, yes, we hear kind of trial level court. We've heard this appellate level court. Um, how do you see these different levels of court being different enough that they fill in this fuller concept of the judicial branch? Um, why, why, why is it important to have trial court versus an appellate court? Well, I think it's a matter of fairness to the parties that are involved. Is uh, In our state, uh, the state of Indiana, uh, when you go through the trial court level, if you don't like the result that you have, you have an automatic right to appeal. Uh, that quite honestly goes for criminal defendants as well. An appellate process can be very expensive. However, uh, if you're indigent, you cannot afford uh, to hire a lawyer for your appeal, then one is appointed for you. Uh, and so consequently, about 65% of the cases that we deal with are criminal cases. Uh, the rest are family law cases and uh, um, civil cases. If a, and a litigant does not like the result that he gets at the Court of Appeals, then he can petition to transfer to the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court makes that decision uh, as to uh, whether or not they want to accept that court. To kind of give you an example, our trial courts in the state of Indiana do about 1.7 million cases a year. Our 
Court of Appeals, our, which is what I'm part of, our Intermediate Court of Appeals, writes about 2,000 opinions a year. And then our Supreme Court writes anywhere from 60 to 75 uh, opinions off of our cases a year. So you can see it's really kind of an, uh, an inverse pyramid with the trial courts doing the heavy lifting. Uh, and as you move up the appellate chain, uh, not as many cases. So, uh, but once again, like I said, our cases are all written, the decisions are all written. Yes, and I would I would add to that um, the, the the idea of um, that there is um, you know a constitutional um, requirement for the counties to have a circuit court, um, and I operate in a superior court, so I I assist. I'm a statutorily um, based um, authority um, in the judiciary, and so I assist that circuit court in deciding cases. Um, and there are a lot of cases, just like what Judge Altice um, indicated. Um, and we are located in the locale where the controversy um, is ongoing. Um, and so I think that um, for access to the courts, we need that level of trial courts to be there, um, to be accessible, um, and to be open um, for um, the decisions to be um, heard promptly, um, and for there to be, um, you know, that case to be resolved um, expeditiously. I, I think that's such a great explanation there of, of how each of these levels of court add something to, uh, and I think it was Judge Altai said, you know, kind of the fairness of our, our system and, and making sure everybody has an opportunity to be heard and, and go through a, a fair legal process. Which kind of leads me to thinking that the words judge, judicial branch, kind of have the same root as the word justice. So I guess my question would be, how do you def how do you guys define justice, and how do you see your role as a judge to make sure that there is justice? Yes, I think the, the easy, simple definition is is justice is the uh, the quality of being fair and impartial, and uh, I think we do that on a daily basis. And as Judge Granger talked about, um, having our courts open to all, and uh, it doesn't matter what your your walk of life, uh, you are in our country, uh, you walk into a court and you have the same opportunity as anybody else. And uh, so that's how I would define justice. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that 100%, Judge Altice. Um, you know, whenever I um, have thought about this, I, I think about the language um, that really is in the preamble um, of our Constitution, um, securing justice. Um, that's really the root um, that comes before all the rest. Um, so I think that it, I think even better than it being the root, I think it is also the heartbeat um, of our work um, as judges. Um, it, it really pretty much. Um, I think comes down to when someone uh, turns to the courts for help or, and they summons that courage, you know, to face a wrong that has been done or some sort of unfair practice or some sort of unequal treatment. That's sort of the, the bond of this constitutional promise of justice. Um, and we're connected because we all accept um, the promise for how we're gonna handle things. So when someone comes into a trial court in the courtroom where I'm at, tells me their story. Um, I'm going to listen. I'm going to decide it fairly and impartially. Um, and that's going to be the decision that we follow. So that resolves that dispute, but it also um, does a little bit more. Um, it helps to restore um, any imbalance um, that may have existed, um, either in accountability, power control, privilege um, that's contributing to that dispute. So I think that's the the, the broadest picture um, of justice. I that sounds so so great to hear, and, and knowing that our our courts are free and open, and and looking to make sure that the fairness is there, um, a great underpinning of of American democracy. I think I think you hit that there, and I think it was. You, Judge Granger, that you know, kind of took it back to our constitutional principle within there, or the the preamble. Um, 
So uh, my next question kind of leads from there. Within our Constitution, we see three branches of government. We have that legislative branch that makes the law. We have an executive branch that's supposed to carry out the law. And, and now we're talking about the judicial branch, which I think when we learn in school, we hear the judicial branch interprets the law, which is always a weird concept. I think when I was growing up, I don't, what does it mean to interpret the law? How would you guys answer that? What, what do you do when you interpret the law? So I will, I'll start again, uh, Judge Granger, hopefully uh, we're in a, we're in a, uh, a groove here. Uh, so to me, to, when, when, when you talk about interpreting the law, uh, to interpret the law means to uh, determine the intended meaning of a written document. And that written, written document could be either the Constitution, could be state statutes that our legislators create, uh, could be a contract that the parties have entered into to do some type of uh, business deal, could be a deed to transfer property, or could be a will uh, when someone uh, passes away. So those documents, then it's up to the judicial branch to uh, interpret what those documents mean in the specific setting uh, in which those documents are being used. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with Judge Altice. Um, um, that is a, a, a great description of the substantial part of that. You know, I think interpretation of the law is such a big responsibility. Um, and I guess maybe practically, when I look at, you know, how do I go about doing it as a trial court judge? You know, I start out with my ears first, you know, I've got two of them for a reason. And so I use them to listen very carefully to the facts that are being presented during the case. Um, I want to keep my mind open um, and I, I don't want to, you know, advance any judgment um, as I go along um, before um, I have had a chance to hear everything. Um, so it, it requires not just listening to what's being said, but how and when and where and by whom and to whom it's being said and then weighing, you know, the credibility, you know, what parts do I believe or not, all or none. Um, it also takes me checking my, um, any bias, um, conscious or unconscious, um, or any prejudice um, that I may have in my own thinking. Um, and it certainly requires me to faithfully apply the law that exists to these facts. Um, so Maria Granger's personal opinion of the law is of no value. Um, and it has to stay out of Judge Granger's way um, in this process of interpretation. And, you know, when this is done well, um, just like Judge Altice has said already, I mean, it achieves a decision that is fair and impartial. Uh, I, I, it's great. I think it's it's helpful to hear that, especially, like I said, from the early age, I think interpretation can be a difficult verb to understand when you take it to the law. Um, so let me throw another term that I know is uh, put out there for uh, to learn about the judicial branch, and that being the rule of law. So how would you explain the rule of law? Is Why is it important? Why is this an important concept? So I think there are several, several parts uh, when you're talking about uh, the rule of law, uh, it, the, the most important being equality before the law. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, everyone, regardless of their position uh, or their status, is subject uh, to the same legal principles. Uh, so I think that's an important function of the rule of law. I also think that legal certainty and predictability is, an, uh, is also important when talking about the rule of law. And what I mean by that is, you know, we want to make sure that our laws are clear, that they're stable and they're predictable. Uh, so, for example, uh, speed limit signs. We know uh, it makes we know how fast we're allowed to travel on the highway. Uh, and there are laws that establish those signs and uh, the signs there to greet you so that it's predictable. Um, contracts uh, uh, are enforceable because parties can rely on established legal principles that have been set down. Uh, for the last couple hundred years. And then lastly, I, I think due process and in, in fair trials is also uh, a big part of the rule of law. Defendants have a right in a criminal case to legal representation, and judges must uh, follow uh, established legal principles in dealing with those trials. So that's what uh, the rule of law means to me. Yeah, I think that was such a 
an all encompassing response. Um, maybe um, when I think about my, my shorthand version, I, I, I think of two words, total accountability. Um, the rule of law is sort of this ideal of total accountability for all of us who are living in the world. I think some I have, you know, when I, we've discussed this, view it um, more of like a political ideal that underpins democracy and the freedoms, the rights and responsibilities that go with it. Um, but I sort of perceive it a bit more broadly um, as being essential, um, like Judge Altice was referring to, to those relationships and those dealings um, of individuals and institutions and entities. Um, something that requires all of us to do that very fundamental act of taking an honest look at our part. Um, I think that is essential to the rule of law. Well, thank you. That, that, uh, I think that both those answers really help us take the kind of difficult concept to think about in the rule of law, made it, made it easier to hear and tangible and something that we can go through. I'm going to do one more term at you here. Uh, judicial independence. We hear that one there too. It do you, How do you see that working within your court? Um, is it more than just a separation of powers kind of philosophy? How do you see judicial independence? So I just, to me, the simple explanation uh, for younger members of our audience out there is, is stay in your lane, bro. Uh, and, and that that is uh, what I think just judicial independence is all about. The legislator has a job to do, uh, and we have a job to do, and the executive branch has a job to do. And I, I think it's important for the judicial branch not to encroach on uh, those other uh, branches of government. For example, uh, when the legislature uh, uh, sets out a statute and that becomes law, and it's oftentimes up to us to interpret that law. If the language of the statute is not ambiguous, then we should give the actual meaning uh, to those words in interpreting that statute. Uh, issues sometimes arise where the language is a little bit ambiguous. And when that happens, uh, there are certain rules that we try to follow so that we don't encroach upon uh, their, uh, their job of making the laws. Uh, so sometimes it becomes difficult, but I think as long as you Keep in mind the principle that our job is to interpret the laws and not create the laws, uh, then uh, I, I think uh, as a judge, you can do a good job of staying in your lane. <laughs> I, I like that. That is that is such a um, practical explanation and so true. Um, you know, at, at the trial level, I would I would um, only add that, you know, there's sort of an affirmative responsibility um, in every aspect of administering justice. Um, that judicial independence is critical. So I also look at it from the vantage point of, you know, I, I'm not going to play favorites. Um, can't happen. Um, I can't give in to force, can't give in any pressure. Um, and, you know, in my local community or any kind of influence um, that's, you know, special um, to the case or interest in the case, um, I can't fear um, retribution for the decisions that I make. Um, it's 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 inherent, um, as you say it said, in the separation of powers. And I think there is some active contribution that we have to give to it each day, um, at, at all levels, um, but particularly um, at the trial court level, to maintain um, that consistency with judicial independence. Oh, that's great to hear. And the whole whole pieces. I think a lot of these last few questions. Very difficult topics and uh, of understanding our judicial branch that I, I think were great answers and to help our audience to better understand the the, the role within the judicial branch. I kind of want to break a little bit and kind of ask you about you as a judge and what you've seen. Uh, are you willing to describe a case that you have seen in your career that maybe just keeps noodling in your head that you keep thinking about? What, find, what do you find interesting about the cases in front of you? So, yes, I, I mean, as prior to coming to the Court of Appeals, I was a trial judge like uh, Judge Granger. And, of course, you have a lot of cases that stay with you, some good and many of them bad. And I, I oftentimes think uh, uh, there are certain murder cases that I, I cannot get out of my head, it's, uh, which tells you it's tough being a judge. Uh, 
uh, no matter what level. But uh, I think for our purposes here, one case that I found uh, fascinating that I, I always like to think about going back to the rule of law and the equality before the law uh, is I had a simple speeding case that came across my desk uh, here at the Court of Appeals. Uh, it was a gentleman that got stopped for speeding. I think he was going 55 and a 35. Uh, and he fought the ticket. And his argument was, as judge, there was no sign. There was nothing posted to tell me uh, what the speed limit was. So how can I violate the speed limit when I don't know what the speed limit is? And the trial judge kind of pushed him off and said, no, I'm going to find you guilty. Uh, and he continued on, represented himself at the appellate level, wrote his own brief. Uh, and lo and behold, I started looking at the statutes and he was absolutely correct. Uh, and so we reversed the trial judge, uh, took away his speeding ticket. And I just, I think it's a simple case, but I, I really I think it really shows how no matter who you are uh, in our system of justice, uh, everyone is equal that comes before uh, the court system. Well, that's, been, that's interesting. I, I think I'd heard about that case, Judge Altice. It was Lawrence uh, uh, downtown, uh, not not too far from you, but uh, mm -hmm. certainly not in your jurisdiction. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, you know, I, I had, a, I, I'd have to think about this. I've been asked this question before, um, and you know, typically when I decide cases, there's so many to do. I try to get them decided. My strategy is to get them decided and keep it moving forward. And, and not to linger, um, but one case in the very early, um, like the very first year that I took the bench, that I got on special, um, it saddened me. Um, and it was it, it was like a nine-year-old case when I got it. So I wasn't the only one who found this hard. Um, it involved a young family of very modest means um, with a newborn baby um, that through birth suffered as asphyxiation. Um, and ultimately was diagnosed with cerebral palsy um, and faced a life of just severe physical limitations. So the parents ultimately, they sued the doctor, the hospital for medical negligence. Um, and I was faced right before trial on the eve of trial with a pretrial motion um, to exclude the parents expert ultimately for lack of qualification to give an opinion um, on the newborn, on the cause of the newborn's condition, which I granted. Um, and then immediately ordered it um, to Judge Altice and his court to review my decision. Um, I, you know, it was really hard because um, they weren't going to be able to afford um, the expert that they needed to bring their case. Um, and so I, it just always leaves me saddened um, to reflect on um, a hardship like that. So that's a case that kind of sticks with me, not maybe so much for its interest, but just for its emotional impact. Thank you for the two um, different stories that, that showcase there's, there's a lot of humanism within our court system too. Um, and it's important to keep in mind as we think through that. And, and I'm sure you keep in mind as you sit on that bench and look through um, the filings and the people in front of you. Um, so I kind of want to close with the last question then. Why, why did you want to become a judge? We hear these stories that you talk with that, that are in different parts of the spectrum there. So why, why, why do you want to keep being a judge? I'm going to assume you like being a judge. Um, how'd you, how'd you get to become a judge? Why, you know, that type of thing. The, where's your background on that? So, yes. So for me, I, 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 I don't think it was that I ever planned on being a judge. I think a lot of becoming a judge, no matter what type of judge you are, is a lot of timing, being at the right place at the right time. Uh, I will say that I did want to become a lawyer. Uh, I was first generation college on both sides of my family. And uh, to me, uh, if I was going to go to college, I might as well be something. And to me, being something uh, was being a lawyer. And so that was the path I chose. As my career progressed, um, as a prosecutor for a long time, I practiced civil law. The timing was ripe, uh, uh, and I ran for judge, and I happened to get elected. And the same thing with the current judge that I uh, that I am. That was all timing. I put my application in, uh, and after two previous tries, on the third try, I was finally successful. 
Um, so that's how I got to where I am. And the answer to your question, do I like my job? No, I love my job. Uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful job. Um, this job's a lot more laid back. I love my days on the trial bench uh, because you really could uh, change people's lives uh, and you were really instrumental in solving people's problems. So uh, that's how I got to where I got to. For me, my story is um, similar and different, similar in certain ways and different in certain ways. Um, I worked for many years as a um, deputy prosecutor and in private practice. Um, and it was the bailiff um, and the judge that I worked in front of and um, a state representative who approached me whenever, the, whenever there was a new court in my county that was coming open. And they said, you should try to run for that. Um, and I could, I never saw that. I mean, I never even considered it, not one time. Um, and so them, them seeing me in a certain way helped me see me in a certain way. So sometimes it's what someone else can show you um, that you can do. So I ran a contested primary in general um, and was elected um, and continue to serve. And I love serving. Um, I think I alluded to it before, you know, being in the law is really a heartbeat for me. I've told people so many times, I just, I really think justice, you know, the law and justice enhances humanity. Um, and that is its gift to us all. Um, when I started, I didn't have any plans to be a lawyer. I planned to go to music. Um, and um, I set that all aside when I was a high school senior. I was 17. Um, and it was at that time that we had, my family suffered a tragedy. Um, and it really, uh, and it was a tragedy as part of the justice system, um, essentially. And uh, it's something that just changed my steps. I think my uncle and his experience just sort of redirected my steps to the law um, because I knew I had to be an integral part of the system that can align the law as it is with justice as people um, are craving. So that's how I got here. Thank you for sharing those stories. And, and I'll, I mean, I know Indiana is better because we have these two fine jurists and judges um, as part of our judicial system. So that's the time we have for our conversation today. I want to thank you both, Judge Altice, Judge Granger, for this conversation, your insights, your knowledge, um, teaching us about the judicial branch and about yourself. So thank you. It's been great for me, a great hearing from you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. And so thanks to all who watched this conversation to learn about the judicial branch as a part of the 2024 National Civic Learning Week. We appreciate it.